For this lecture, we're going to be going into game theory and how we use it to study what's going on with oligopolies. Um, it's the only uh, market structure that you don't have to learn a graph for. Uh, now, there is a graph for it, um, but it's been taken out of the AP curriculum. So don't worry about it. Uh, if you want to learn about that, uh, feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, put something together for you. But in the meantime, game theory is just sort of the study of how interdependent decision makers make choices. So when what the other party does affects you, how do you make your choices? Now, we are going to be doing a very simplified version of game theory uh, for the AP test. That's all you have to know. You only have to know a simple version of game theory. Nothing, nothing more than that. So. Uh, some important things to uh, remember about how our setup is going to work. One, these are non-cooperative games. So the two players, or in our cases, usually firms, uh, they are not able to actually discuss what's going on. They know all of the information. They know the payoffs for themselves and for the other player, but they're not allowed to collude. So. Um, what they really care about, because they're self-interested, is to um, maximize their own individual payoffs. They don't care about the other side. If the other side makes a lot of money, they don't care because it doesn't affect them. If they make a lot of money, that's what they care about. They only care about themselves. So self-interested, non-cooperative games. Now, some general terms. This uh, thing that you see over here on the right-hand side, that, that is the payoff matrix. It shows the different payoffs for each player. So the players are outlined usually on the top and the side. So here we have firm two, that's one of the players. Firm one, that's the other player. They then have their two strategies. So here is strategy one, in this case, produce 30 million pounds. Here's strategy two, produce 40 million pounds. Firm two has the same strategies, produce 30 million, produce 40 million. Now these strategies do not always have to be the, exactly the same. They can be different. Um, but either way, you read the payoff matrix in the exact same way. You take a look at it and you say, what's in the upper right hand portion of the matrix or sometimes you'll see it listed out side by side and uh, it will explicitly tell you which payoff goes to which firm then. Uh, usually it's the one listed second goes to the top one. So in this top right hand portion, that goes to firm two. So all of these payoffs go to firm two. All of these payoffs that I'm underlining the words of go to firm one. Most frequently when they're listed side by side, separated with a comma, uh, that one will be listed first. Once again, in the setup for the question, it will tell you which one goes to which firm. It's important that you keep track of which one goes to which firm. Some students find it better to draw their own line down the center. Uh, diagonal line down the center, as you see done here. Some uh, right above each one of the ones, uh, right above each payoff, which firm it goes to. Whatever does the trick for you is uh, is what you want to do. Now, for dominant strategy, now this is where we start getting into the analysis. Dominant strategy is the action that is best for your firm, regardless of what the other player does. So once again, you are not caring what the other player does in terms of your payoff. So you look at the payoffs, and if one strategy is best for you, no matter what the other firm does, that's your dominant strategy. So if you look at firm one, if they produce 40 million pounds, so we'll, we'll start down here, produce 40 million pounds. The, if they're trying to find the dominant strategy here, uh, if firm two produces 30 million while firm one produces 40 million, then firm one makes 200 million in profit. If firm one uh, produces 30 million and firm two produces 30 million, firm one 
uh, makes 180 million in profit. So so far, firm one choosing 40 million pounds is better than choosing 30 million. But we don't know yet if it's the dominant strategy. We just know that in the case of firm two picking 30 million pounds, it's better for firm one to do 40 million. So let's check what happens when we switch uh, what firm two does. So firm one does 40 million pounds. They make 160 million profit. Is that more than what happens if they switch to 30 million? It is because they'd make 150 million when firm two chooses to make 40 million pounds. So regardless of whether firm two chooses to make 30 million pounds or 40 million pounds, firm one always has a higher profit making 40 million pounds. Therefore, firm one's dominant strategy is producing 40 million pounds because these payoffs in this row are greater than the ones in the row above it for firm one. So that's firm one's dominant strategy. Firm two, let's see if they have a dominant strategy. Um, now you probably can figure this out because it's all mirrored um, payoffs, but it won't always be mirror, mirrored payoffs. So you do have to make sure you do this uh, when you have questions for each player. So let's take a look at it. Uh, when firm two produces 30 million pounds and firm one produces 30 million pounds, firm two makes 180 million profit. When firm two produces 40 million pounds and firm one produces 30 million, firm two makes 200 million in profit. So producing 40 million pounds is better than producing 30 million pounds when firm one produces 30 million. So, so far it's looking like 40 million pounds might be firm two's dominant strategy, but we do have to check it against firm one producing 40 million pounds. So is firm two better off when uh, producing 40 million pounds when firm one produces 40 million well if they produce 30 million instead they'd get 150 they get 160 if they produce 40 million therefore this one's better again and since it's better no matter what firm one does that is the dominant strategy so this column is better no matter what firm one does therefore it's the dominant strategy that's how you find it uh, now firms do not always have to have dominant strategies it is possible for one firm to have a dominant strategy and the other one to have no dominant strategy it happens all the time uh, frequently most frequently with free response questions so watch out for that uh, now the nash equilibrium this is related but slightly different this is instead of analyzing a strategy it's analyzing payoffs themselves and it says that no player could be better off by switching already given what the other um, player has done so you examine a specific box with, within the payoff matrix and a lot of times there will be multiple nash equilibriums uh, within a specific payoff matrix so you do have to examine each box separately. Now, there is a quick shortcut to find at least one Nash equilibrium, and that is that it's always at the intersection of dominant strategies. So given that shortcut, we already know that this should be a Nash equilibrium, but let's uh, demonstrate how you analyze that. If you look at this, um, if you look at this payoff spot, is firm one better off switching from 40 million to 30 million given what given that firm two produces 40 million pounds well they make 160 here they make 150 uh, if they switch so they're not better off that's good but now we have to check if firm two is better off if uh, firm two remains where they are they make 160 given that firm one produces 40 million if they switch they make 150 therefore they are better off staying, and that is a Nash equilibrium. Now, what is a Nash equilibrium? What does that mean? It's the tendency of the players to settle on a certain spot. That tends to be 
uh, how much profit they're going to do, and it's going to be their production levels. That's the idea. Um, now, like I said, you could have multiple Nash equilibrium in different um, in different payoff matrices. So you do have to examine each of the payoff spots. So let's look at this one. First is firm one better off switching if uh, you're given that firm two produces 30 million pounds. Well, they make 200 if they stay. They make 180 if they switch. Not better. They're not uh, better off switching, so that's okay. But is it a Nash equilibrium? You got to check to see if uh, firm two is better off switching. Well, firm two, given that firm one produces 40 million pounds, makes 150 if they produce 30. They make 160 if they switch. So they should be better off. Therefore, this is not in Ash equilibrium. Now let's go to the mirror one because it's quick. Uh, given that firm two uh, produces 40 million pounds, is firm one better off switching if they're producing 30 million? Well, if they start at 150, they'd switch, they'd get 160. Therefore, they would be better off switching, and that can't be an Ash equilibrium. If we now look at uh, this one, the upper left hand corner, where they both produce 30 million pounds, would firm two be better off switching? Uh, so if they stay, they make 180, given that firm one makes 30 million. If they switch, they make 200 million. They're much better off switching, not an Ash equilibrium. So our only Nash equilibrium here is the bottom right hand corner where both firms produce 40 million pounds. Now, as I said, be careful. There isn't always going to be just one Nash equilibrium. So you do need to analyze all of the boxes. Now we're going to examine a specific type of, um, of payoff matrix, and that is the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, each player has an incentive to choose an action that seems to benefit uh, his or herself at the other player's expense. And in the end, when they both do that, they end up in a worse spot than they would have had they colluded, had they acted cooperatively. So this is a, a very classic type problem. So you have to imagine two crooks, and they are both coming in and uh, they've been arrested. Uh, the, the government has them on some pretty, uh, pretty limited charges already. Uh, so if they both remain silent because they can only get them on those limited charges, they both only get two years in prison. If, however, one of the crooks decides to, uh, decides to rat on somebody, on the other crook, if they confess, then they get their sentence reduced to one year, and the other person who didn't confess gets more time in jail. So they get 20 years. If both end up confessing, both end up incriminating each other for further crimes, and they both end up with five more year, with five years in prison. That's the basic setup. Now, these crooks are separated. They're not allowed to talk to each other. And therefore, that's how the, this problem comes about. So you can almost imagine a police officer going in and saying, listen, your buddy's going to gonna tell on you. You better tell on them. So you get a reduced sentence out of this uh, and trying to, to work them in that way. And let's now look what happens with this when you're analyzing it with a uh, with the game theory mindset. So if you're analyzing this with the game theory mindset, let's find out who has uh, what dominant strategy. Because most people in looking at this problem would want both to end up in this box where it says silent and silent, and they both only end up with two years. But is that the dominant strategy for both of them to remain silent? Is that the Nash equilibrium? Well, let's check it out. If crook one remains silent, so for here, crook one remains silent and crook two confesses, crook one gets 20 years in prison. Well, if they switched, they'd only get five years. So they definitely have an incentive to switch from silent to confessing. 
over here, if they stayed silent while Crook 2 stayed silent, they get two years. But they only get one year if they confessed. So they have an incentive to switch. No matter what the um, no matter what the situation is with Crook 2, no matter what Crook 2's strategy is, Crook 1 has the dominant strategy of confessing. Because the payoffs are always better for Crook 1 when they confess than if they stay silent. Now let's look if uh, Crook 2 has the same thing going on. Well, if Crook 2 stays silent while Crook 1 confesses, they get 20 years in prison. If they switch to confessing, they only get five years. They're going to be wanting to confess there. Is that the dominant strategy, though? Let's take a look at the next one. If Crook 1 stays silent and Crook 2 confesses, they get one year. If they stayed, if they both stayed silent, Crook 2 would get two years. So confessing, once again, yields a better outcome. They are incentivized to confess. So the dominant strategy here is for both Crook 1 and Crook 2 to confess. They both have that dominant strategy. And so when you look at this stuff, this is where you get into um, uh, people who commit crimes often telling on each other because they are incentivized to do that. That is a, an explicit um, incentive in the structure deliberately brought up uh, to, help, um, uh, to help police uh, do their work. Now, I always sa I said before that the intersection of dominant strategies is always a Nash equilibrium. So is both of these uh, crooks confessing a Nash equilibrium? Uh, well, if crook one confesses and crook two confesses, they both get five years. Is crook one better off switching to silent? Well, crook one will get 20 years if they remain silent. So no, definitely not better. Crook 2, if they switch from confess to silent, they'd get 20 years. So definitely not better. So this is a Nash equilibrium. Are there any other Nash equilibriums here? Well, if let's take a look at Crook 1 remains silent and Crook 2 confesses. So in this case, Crook 1 gets 20 years. Are they better off switching to confess? Well, they'd get five years if they confess. So that's absolutely an incentive to move, not a Nash equilibrium. Uh, if Crook 1 confesses and Crook 2 remains silent, Crook 1 gets one year. They have no reason to uh, switch to silent because then they'd get two years. But Crook 2, if they confessed, they'd switch over to five years. So they have an incentive, incentive to switch. Definitely not Nash equilibrium. Now, the one that everybody wants them to get to, the two years and two years, is that a Nash equilibrium? Well, let's see. Uh, if Crook 1 decides to switch from silent to confess, they only get one year. So they are incentivized to switch. Therefore, it's not an Ash equilibrium. Crook 2 has the same incentive. If they switched, they'd get only get one year as well. So there's only one Nash equilibrium here, and it's for both of them to confess, which is why it happens so often. And that's also why organized crime tends to have certain uh, things to stop people from confessing. So usually, confessing uh, comes with some sort of bodily harm to you and your family. Uh, if you add that into all of these, um, into all of these payoffs, you're going to realize that your payoff matrix has now changed, and it will change up your incentives. That's something else you have to note for the AP test. They will frequently make you change payoffs. So, if we take a look at this once again, and erase the ink. And now let's put in the idea that these guys might be or in organized crime. And the confession, if, uh, if the organized crime finds out they've confessed, let's add bodily harm to all of those payoffs. So confess, confess, plus harm, plus harm. Uh, in this one, Crook 1 confesses, so they get plus harm. This one, Crook 2 confesses, plus harm. Now, assuming that that bodily harm is very, very bad, that would be the worst of the payoffs. So, in this case, what is the dominant strategy? Well, you might get 20 years, but you'd rather get 20 years rather than a bodily harm of confessing. So, you want to stay silent as crook one. 
two years staying silent versus one year and bodily harm, yeah, still better. So silent now turned into your dominant strategy. You switched up the game. Crook two has the same thing. So that's why when you have organized crime uh, and there is that extra threat, that extra change to the payoff, that's how you get a, um, a different spot on your uh, payoff matrix. Now, obviously businesses, when we're talking economics, businesses are gonna have repeated interaction. Now this can lead to a different uh, strategic behavior. You can have some tit for tat strategy. Uh, so you might start by tacitly uh, cooperating uh, by restricting your output and increasing your price. But if one firm cheats that tacit collusion, well then, then likely that you will do the same thing. They lower their price, you lower yours to steal uh, people away. Um, then they lower theirs and so on and so on and so on. Um, now the tacit collusion that I've been talking about is just that cooperation without a formal agreement. Uh, so that way you don't actually um, you know, violate any laws. Um, so usually when we talk about tacit collusion, it's also known as the, um, uh, the cartel version. Uh, where everybody works together to set a monopoly price and 